Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Prairie's Regional Adaptation Collaborative's Forum on Climate Change and Mental Health. My name is Joellen Perry, and I am the Adaptation Lead at the International Institute for Sustainable Development, which acts as the Secretariat for the PRAC. The PRAC is a cost-share initiative between the governments of Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, as well as Natural Resources Canada, and it aims to increase the capacity of government and uh, civil society decision makers on the prairies to understand, prepare for, take action to address the implications of our changing climate. This year, the PRAC has hosted webinars focused on municipal adaptation efforts and building the resilience of infrastructure to greater risk of flooding uh, as our climate changes. And today's webinar is focused on climate change and mental health. It's a bit of a different topic for us, and it's also being done with a different format. Um, in addition to the traditional webinar, we are uh, have three groups gathered in each of Edmonton, Regina, and Winnipeg, uh, who will be able to interact with one another, and both during the webinar, and then we have um, plans to and engage with each other individually um, after the webinar portion has been completed. Um, we hope that this will provide greater opportunity for the exchange of ideas and sharing of thoughts in terms of our efforts to increase our capacity to deal with the greater risk of climate change going forward. Uh, today's webinar, as I said, is focused on climate change and mental health and the well-being of communities on the Canadian prairies. We will begin by having two overview presentations on climate change impacts on mental health, followed by a look at three case studies that describe mental health effects stemming from climate impacts, including natural disasters, and the ways that mental health can be supported through emergency response and traditional knowledge. Our first group of speakers today are Katie Hayes, a PhD candidate at the Della Lana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto, and lead author of the mental health chapter for the Canadian uh, Climate Change and Health Assessment, and Erin Myers from the Climate Change and Health Adaptation Program, First Nations and Inuit Health Branch of Indigenous Services Canada. Following a short question and answer session with these two presenters, we will then hear case study presentations from Misamaki Lori Brave Rock, a Kainai Askakami Pikikiwi activist and environmentalist, Mark Hamashimak, Director of Health of the Disaster Recovery Program in the Addictions and Mental Health Branch of Alberta Health. Uh, Vincent Agapong, a clinical professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Alberta. And then a joint presentation by Patrick Hasler, Emergency Response Coordinator, and Glenda Watson, Mental Health and Addictions Advisor for the Canadian Services Unit of the Northern Intertribal Health Authorities Partners. We are asked that each of these speakers present for about 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, there will be opportunities built into the today's session for questions and you will be able to uh, participate online. And to do so, please write your questions in the questions panel at any time during the presentations and we'll answer as many of them as possible following both the overview presentations and then after the case studies. Uh, for those of you participating in the webinar in person in Edmonton, Regina, and Winnipeg. You will also be able to ask questions verbally over your conference lines. Please indicate to your room facilitator during the question and answer sessions that you would like to speak, and then we'll open up the line for you to do so. So to get things started, we'll, I'd like to introduce Katie Hayes uh, with the Della Lana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto and she will be providing an overview presentation on the linkages between climate change and mental health. Katie. Great, thanks Joellen, can you hear me okay? Yes, 
Yes. Okay, great. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to provide an overview on climate change and mental health. Um, I'll talk as quickly as I can to go over this overview, looking at the uh, risks and impacts, um, also measurement and surveillance, um, also some key considerations within the topic area, and then I'll conclude with an overview of some interventions to address the problem area and briefly touch on um, psychosocial adaptation. I don't... Okay, there we go. Um, so firstly, um, it's important to define what we mean when we talk about mental health. So mental health is located in the broader definition of psychosocial health. And psychosocial health really has two branches, the psychological, which includes mental wellness, as well as mental problems and mental illness, and the social well-being, which includes um, relationships with others, one's context and culture. So for example, things that affect our social well-being, like displacement related to climate change, can affect a person's sense of place, culture, um, and identity. How does climate change affect mental health? Well, um, in 2010, a team of Australian researchers provided this diagram, and there's been many diagrams that have uh, been updated, um, one in particular in the US, but I like this one because it provides an overview of locating climate change within um, the broader economic, social, cultural, and environmental context. And then it takes a look at climate change-related hazards, whether they're acute, like for example, flooding or wildfires, subacute like chronic uh, drought and then chronic events like rising temperatures and then there's three different pathways um, to look at how the impacts of uh, climate change affect mental health so on the left hand side we see that there are community impacts related to damage to landscape and agriculture which affects the economic social and demographic demographics of a community that can have um, impacts on grief and displacement and then there are also physical health impacts, and we know that the physical health impacts can affect our mental health as well. And then finally, on the right-hand side, we see the direct trauma related to climate change, from climate change, and this is what I'll talk about in the next slide. Uh, briefly, the term solastalgia there, I'll go over that uh, later as well, but it is basically um, feeling homesick in your home environment because your home environment has changed so drastically because of climate hazards. <clears throat> so what are some of the mental health outcomes? So in the research, we see there's a whole host of mental health outcomes. And as I mentioned, it's not mental health is not just um, to refer to mental illness or mental problems, but there's also affirmative mental health outcomes. So some of the things that we see are um, post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, anxiety, and grief. Um, we also see things like suicidal ideation and suicide related, related to heat waves. Mm -hmm. Um, there's also issues of violence and aggression as resources become scarce, uh, for example, food insecurity or water insecurity. There's also things like survivor guilt or vicarious trauma. Um, vicarious trauma we've seen um, in different communities who maybe have not necessarily been exposed to a climate hazard, but they have loved ones um, who've been experiencing um, such a hazard. And then there are things like altruism, compassion, and post-traumatic growth. And post-traumatic growth here refers to a sense of meaning in one's life. And these more affirmative mental health outcomes are understudied uh, at present, but they provide a really uh, strong opportunity to inform um, psychosocial adaptation. And we see some of these more affirmative mental health outcomes as communities band together to support one another after a climate-related hazard has occurred. Um, there's also a specific environment related trauma. So some of you may have seen some of these terms before. Um, they are terms that are not official or static, but they're rather they're terms that health practitioners and scholars have generated to describe some of the responses that they've been seeing. So the, the environmental philosopher, Glenn Albrecht, calls these terms psychoteratic syndromes. So basically combining the psychology with, uh, and, the, and uh, sorry, assessing the psychology as well as um, the relationship with the environment. And so we see things like eco-anxiety, which refers to the anxiety that people can uh, feel by being constantly surrounded by the problems associated with climate change. There's something called eco-paralysis, which refers to the complex feeling of not being able to do anything grand enough to mitigate or stop the climate change problem. Um, the term eco-grief comes to us from Dr. Ashley Consolo and um, Neville Ellis, who really research, whose fo her research focus is on indigenous communities. And eco-grief refers to the distress related to ecological loss or anticipated loss related to climate change. And then, of course, uh, the term solastalgia, which I mentioned before. 
A few key considerations uh, are that the that climate change acts as a threat multiplier to existing determinants of health. And these determinants include biological, behavioral, social, environmental, and cultural factors. Another key consideration is that the triggers and timings of mental health outcomes may vary from person to person or community to community. So we see three important timelines when we're studying the area of climate change and mental health, and those include the immediate effects, so those are hours, days, weeks after a climate hazard has occurred, mid-range, which is typically six months to a year, and then two and a half years and beyond. So oftentimes it's important to consider that the immediate effects of an extreme event are referred to as acute trauma and are often um, seen as normal reactions to an abnormal situation. And then mid-range to long-term psychosocial outcomes tend to be things like anxiety, depression, stress, including post-traumatic stress disorder and drug and alcohol misuse. Um, I think the triggers and timing is very important. I know my research focuses on the 2013 High River Alberta floods. And I did my research, I conducted my research five years after the 2013 flood wherein there were still um, self-reports of post-traumatic stress uh, and anxiety, particularly when it rains. There's also um, reported uh, feelings of feeling on edge and a, a higher um, awareness and an easiness with the amount of snowpack, for example, in the Rocky Mountains and the amount of precipitation the community gets. Um, it's also very important to locate the topic area within um, the populations of concern because as I mentioned, climate change acts as a threat multiplier. So people who are already experiencing marginaliz marginalization in society tend to experience the impacts of climate change more. So this includes our indigenous um, communities, uh, children and youth, uh, older adults, people with pre-existing conditions, women, people who are racialized, uh, homeless, and also we need to consider that another population of concern that might not necessarily be marginalized in society, but are outdoor laborers who are exposed to climate hazards, in particular extreme heat. So how do we monitor and measure uh, the mental health impacts of climate change. So this was a, a key area of curiosity for me. Um, myself and Dr. Blake Poland uh, recently prepared a paper uh, to speak to this subject matter. And, and what we did is we took a look at um, the literature. So we analyzed the literature of about 236 um, uh, research located on climate change and mental health globally. And we assessed, um, so what are the climate hazards? Who are the populations of concern? What are some of the potential mental health outcomes related to that hazard? And how do you measure and monitor um, these outcomes? So again, this is based on the literature. This is just one snapshot of extreme heat, um, but the paper includes uh, additional areas. And the rationale for this is that we're seeing a lot more communities conducting climate change and health uh, assessments. And uh, there was a lack of uh, focus on the mental health indicators and on a lot of the reasons for this was that there was there's uncertainty about how to measure and monitor so this is to provide a bit of guidance in that regard <clears throat> Interventions. So what are we seeing that's being done to support communities um, and people as they experience the climate change mental health outcomes? Well, um, we know that there are different programs and practices. Um, these can include things like specific therapies or medications provided by healthcare professionals. It could be specific behavioral interventions. Um, there are also community-based mental health care, like uh, climate change resilient plans that address psychosocial well-being. There's also specialized training, like, for example, psychological first aid amongst community members. So a few things that I wanted to highlight quickly were some of the notable interventions that I've seen, I've come across. So in terms of surveillance and monitoring, um, an interesting approach is psychosocial mapping. And what this is, is really mapping the psychological and social care resources in a community before, during, and after a climate hazard has occurred. And what this can translate into is um, something like, for example, a mental health and wellness recovery guide um, that was used, I believe, after the Fort McMurray wildfire. So this document presented information about where to go for different um, psychosocial needs. There are other services like, for example, roving mental health care to address um, communities that have been displaced by climate hazards and also things like telemental health care and walk-in mental health care. Some other approaches that we would like to consider as well, um, in particular, I'll just touch briefly on the land-based healing. So to support Indigenous communities who've traditionally found psychosocial enhancement through land-based healing practices, this is an approach um, that um, can be considered. Some other innovative approaches in the literature, um, one comes from uh, the New York University Environmental Health Clinic. I find this one particularly interesting. So 
what the environmental health clinic does is they accept impatients. So it's people who are impatiently waiting for legislative change on climate change and they're prescribed with actions for environmental action. So it's really addressing that problem focused coping. Um, we also have mobile mental health interventions, nature-based therapies, um, faith-based and spiritually based interventions. Uh, notably, uh, faith-based interventions, uh, many community members feel uh, an attachment to their faith-based institutions and they're seen as a trusted resource for folks. Um, and so that's a key community resource to consider. I wanted to also just briefly touch on an interesting approach in High River. So following the 2013 flood, the municipality um, created the Safe Spot Initiative to help build citizen capacity to support mental health. And what this initiative does is it trains um, businesses and agencies in psychological first aid. So businesses around the community, for example, your local hairdresser or coffee shop, um, people will receive training in psychological first aid and then they're post a large orange dot on their establishment window. And this orange dot is to let community members know that this place of business is a safe spot to talk about their mental health. And the objectives of this program are is that any door is the right door to seek mental health care in the community. And this is my last slide, so hopefully I've made it in on time. Um, but it's important to consider uh, what are some of the factors that influence psychosocial adaptation. Um, and briefly before I go over that, it's that we also need to consider that there are co-benefits of climate change mitigation. So we know that there are mental health benefits of active transportation and green infrastructure. Um, when we talk about psychosocial adaptation, we're talking about how we can enhance or build um, coping behaviors, practices, or tools to support mental health and well-being. So chief among these um, factors that can influence psychosocial adaptation is creating a sense of connection in a community. So whether that's building social capital, creating a sense of community that can be highly protective for people. Um, next is collaborative actions. The topic area of climate change and mental health is vast and it requires an all hands on deck approach. So we know that we need um, the interests of in, environmental management and emergency management, mental health care practitioners, trusted community resources to come together to support community health and well-being. Also, um, mental health care options, having a range of mental health care options because we know that there's no one size fits all approach to mental health care. What works for some may not work for others. Um, so oftentimes that may be that these interventions aren't even, um, uh, don't even speak to mental health or talk about, you know, community building or, or social wellness. And then finally, related to having mental health care options is that these options are targeted and culturally relevant to the needs of the community. So with that, I'll say thank you, and hopefully that was a brief overview, but I look forward to all of your questions uh, later in the discussion. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Katie. That was very informative for myself, and I hope others. Um, don't, this topic is new to me, so I'm learning lots. Uh, at this point in time, I'm going to invite Erin uh, Myers uh, to give her presentation. And as I mentioned before, Erin Myers is a senior program officer for the Climate Change and Health Adaptation Program for Indigenous Services Canada. And uh, her presentation is going to be looking at uh, Indigenous peoples, mental health, and climate change. On, and it's called Climate Change Got You Down. So, great title. Thanks, Erin. Hi there. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. So first and foremost, I'd like to let you know that I'm uh, presenting this um, on unceded, unsurrendered Algonquin territory here in Ottawa. And I'm very honored to be here to present um, alongside some amazing panelists. Um, I'm no, by no means an expert on mental health. Um, I'm a senior program officer for a program that supports Indigenous communities on uh, developing their own research on climate change impacts. And some of those pieces that we've presented uh, are, that we have funded over the years touches on the impacts of climate change uh, on mental health and well-being. So I'm going to go over some of those things about what we're hearing uh, from our colleagues and our partners on the ground with regards to climate change and health um, and what some of the really innovative things that communities are doing to address these, um, these concerns as well as discuss a little bit about um, a research piece that we're leading here um, that's looking at the mental health impacts and, and impacts on cultural safety protocols with regards to evacuations due to extreme events such as fires and flooding, etc. 
So let's just see if this is going forward. Oh no. All right, so as I mentioned, I'm gonna go over some of the mental health and climate change and what does that look like uh, for some of the indigenous communities in Canada, what we've heard um, from some of the work we've funded, what is the climate change and health adaptation program, a few indigenous case studies, as well as uh, that research I mentioned. So climate change impacts in Canada look different from coast to coast to coast and indigenous communities, First Nation, Métis and Inuit are dealing with climate change impacts um, in different ways based on where they're located and sometimes oops and sometimes uh, multiple issues so if you're in the arctic it could have to do with permafrost melt and degradation and um, you know the change of migration routes for caribou to the loss of sea ice and what that means to Inuit identity um, increase in fires um, in the west coast and storm surges as well as you know maybe in southern ontario and quebec dealing with heat stress and lyme disease um, as well as flooding in manitoba um, and in other areas in this country. So climate change affects individuals and groups and sectors very differently, depending on the vulnerability, the exposure to the risk and capacity to be resilient. Inequalities influence local coping and adaptive, adaptive capacity. And um, there's, as mentioned by Katie, there are a number of stressors in some cases um, that come compound the issue. In the last year, um, these are some of the events that we've seen in Canada. And looking at these events for myself, or looking at these pictures, this causes me a lot of stress. I'm a mother of two young boys. And so it sometimes feels overwhelming to hear what's going on in Canada and internationally when it comes to climate change impacts, as well as some of the other issues um, going on in the world. And so, as Katie mentioned, um, some of this can cause, you know, paralysis and not knowing what to do, and eco grief and nostalgia and and it really can be overwhelming and, and um, over, and it's hard to know how to proceed and move forward when this kind of hits you um, like this. And so for us, when we talk about climate change and mental health um, in communities and supporting communities and doing research around these issues, we're trying to look at, yes, these things are happening, but what are some of the tools, what are some of the things that communities can do? And this is designed by community to address some of these things and that sense of engaging in the dialogue, having a supporting indigenous voice and climate change adaptation to these issues is fundamental and it, it creates a sense of um, empowerment and a sense of, you know, we are doing something to tackle these issues that we're seeing in our communities um, and across Canada. So when we launched the program South of 60 in 2016, um, the program has been in operation in the north uh, since 2007. We went across the country and we wanted to hear what some of the issues were for communities. And communities are really excited because yes, they're seeing impacts from climate change, but there's such a wealth of knowledge in um, with indigenous knowledge and observation as well as science to try and like, tackle these issues and really become leaders in finding adaptation solutions to these to these impacts um, so communities are have been observing changes for a long time and they're also the ones leading some really innovative pieces to try and deal with the impacts and this is a quote that i like to to share uh, by chief norman bone um, as indigenous peoples we've always done research always search for understanding ways of being and knowing in the world around us in order to survive. We just didn't call it research. And I think that's really key because local observation um, and getting people involved, whether you're a youth, whether you're an elder, whether you're a hunter or, you know, just somebody who is concerned about their, their well-being and their community's well-being, engaging at different levels with, you don't have to be a scientist, you don't have to be an academic. Everybody can be a part of this dialogue to reducing climate change and health impacts specifically, I think, to reducing the mental health impacts of climate change. So for us, it's about strengthening community capacity and supporting local knowledge and indigenous knowledge and science streams. And really, it's for community, by community, and developing that champion of network, uh, network of champions. And I think we have some really excellent um, uh, folks on the panel today that will be sharing a lot of the great work that they're doing. So one of the first projects that we funded, and this is a number of years ago, and I feel like it's one of the first projects that was looking at the mental health impacts on Inuit specifically, and that was out of Rigolet in Inatsiavut, um, led by Inez uh, Shuak and Ashley um, uh, Consolo and Cheryl Lee Harper. And for the, this community and for many communities, 
um, mental health is a key priority because we're not just looking at the climate change impacts on physical health. Communities are looking at climate change impacts of, you know, the climate change impacts on physical me health, mental health, um, community health, as well as spiritual and ceremonial health and cultural health. So this was a really interesting project and the intention was to look at climate change and mental health impacts specifically in Nunatsiavut and Inuit um, and their Inuit um, communities in Nunatsiavut. And at the end of the day, they ended up bringing youth and mentors together to share knowledge, to share skill sets. It was a culturally based program. It was culturally based programming. And I know that Katie mentioned earlier that, that the importance of on the land programming and what that can do for improvement of mental health. Um, and as you can see, like connecting culture and family and community, building skills and enhancing confidence in, enhances confidence and self-esteem, which provides hope for the future. And building those positive relationships with peers and adults and that knowledge translation is key, I think, to reducing some of that mental health impacts from a changing climate and some of the uncertainty, and especially for young people who might not know how they can create, um, how they can make a difference. But really, the young people is really who, the ones who are gonna be leading in developing innovative ways to dealing with climate change impact. Um, here is another one, Selkirk First Nation in Yukon. Um, this was a project that looked at how do you keep your traditions uh, strong at a fish camp when there are no more fish, when, you know, when there are no more salmon. I mean, at the fish camps, this is where a place where, you know, there's that translation of knowledge. And so this project looked at aim to develop a viable community-based adaptation strategy for keeping traditions alive, in particular in continuing fish camps, even when there are no fish. Um, and that was for the health, health and well-being of young people and future generations. Many Northern communities consider traditional based practices as a pathway to mental health and wellness for First Nations youth and keeping traditions um, and Chukchone knowledge and practices and cultures um, well. So this is an interesting project that kind of, you know, connection to land, and I know we're going to hear about this from our other speaker, and that ecological grief when you're losing, um, you know, when you lose the fish, when, you know, when your water is disappearing, when the permafrost melts, when you can't get the caribou, what does that mean for you as a person and your connections, to, which is deeply rooted um, to the land and to those, to those like, traditions that um, go with that. So this is a project that looked at how do we keep those fish camps going without the fish and how do we keep the youth participating in, in culture and knowledge translation even if there are no fish and how to build adaptation plans around that. Um, another project which is a South of 60 project um, and as I mentioned we launched the program in 2016 so we, we're just starting to get some really great um, results from some of this work that we've supported is in Tobique First Nations in New Brunswick and this is a project led by Roxanne Sapier um, and in their community, they're seeing distress from flooding evacuation procedures as well as um, due to on-land flooding, flooding and erosion, and stress from increased cost of transportation during times of flooding. So they wanted to include a cross-generation teaching of on-the-land users to the youth. Um, and again, we're back to this youth uh, translation of knowledge to youth and engaging youth in the adaptation dialogue and supporting well-being um, of the youth and community um, by having those conversations and, and talking about next steps and creating those leaders and, and promoting mental and physical well-being while on the land. So these three case studies in very different parts of the country dealing with very different um, issues related to climate change are, are leading in terms of returning, like, and getting um, on the land programming and really making that connection with youth and, and transgenerational um, knowledge sharing. So the next uh, piece that I would like to share is led by these two amazing young women. Um, we are leading a national uh, research piece that's looking at the mental health impacts of evacuations on Indigenous communities. And here in the Climate Change and Health Adaptation Program, we are not experts in evacuations by any means. But as mentioned earlier, when we went across the country to engage with community, this issue of you know, mental health and wellness and cultural safety during evacuations kept coming up as a gap and that community's voices were not being heard. And so we wanted to do a study across um, and talking to various stakeholders and community um, and service providers to find out 
what is working and what's not working and how can we provide service better, whether you're on the ground um, as a volunteer or whether you're the federal government providing funding or services or whether you're the municipality or province. So this research um, is really to tell a story of what's happening in Canada so that we um, as service providers can do a better job. Um, so this is some of the things that we've heard from interviews with a variety of folks. And um, so the disasters of which many residents spoke pertain not necessarily to the threat of wildfire, but to the effort to protect people from the wildfire itself. So this we felt was a really powerful quote. And we also wanted to highlight that it's, it's about looking at each community and respecting the cultural diversity of each nation. So in evacuations, it's critical that we honor cultural diversity and the traditions, language and culture. In doing this, you are actively breaking down barriers that exist in order to assist evacuees in ways that work for them. And um, unfortunately, Indigenous communities are disproportionately evacuated due to um, climate change events at 28.7 times the rate of off-reserve uh, Canadian counterparts between 2019 and 2016. Um, and we, we know that extreme weather events are going to become more frequent moving forward. And um, these are things that we want to ensure that um, during times of evacuation, mental health and cultural safety are not often adequately considered. And we want to make sure that we are moving towards a way in a way that we are considering and supporting mental health and cultural safety protocols during evacuations. And I think it's really important to understand the history of relocation in Canada for Indigenous populations, which is integral to the, to the encompassing picture of evacuation today. Um, Historical displacement among Indigenous peoples have implicated the moving of communities to reserve lands through forcible means, um, often to unknown places. And um, I think this is really important to consider that the evacuation process itself is very much rooted um, in a way that can cause more trauma. And I think it's important as service providers, those working in emergency management, um, to really be aware of, to reduce the harm caused by evacuations and be aware of the history um, of colonization in this country and what that means and to ensure that we're being aware and sensitive to the needs of communities. And I think the way to do this is really have community voice at the table at all times, deciding and and uh, supporting communities in developing their EM plans to, inc to include mental health and cultural safety, as well as listening to communities and how to do this work um, better. So in the last year and a half, we've interviewed uh, a number of folks um, and, and have learned a lot. And we will be um, releasing the report in the summer, which will go to an Indigenous um, experts team to talk about, to review it and talk about next steps and things that might have been um, missed and things that we can focus on. Some of the, um, some of the pieces that are coming out from this work, are, are there are many themes that are coming out and I think it's something for us to be aware of is that um, evacuations and the impacts on, there are a number of impacts on mental health and evacuations um, in some cases um, are leading to, um, you know, there's food insecurity issues, traditional food security issues. There could be issues around the safety in, of women. There, are, you know, we're funding a, a research piece this year that's looking at uh, a research piece in Manitoba that's looking at um, how to protect children and um, support children during evacuations to minimize PTSD impact. Um, so I think these are all themes that are coming out of this work um, that we need to be aware of um, that fall under that mental health piece. Um, oops, did I go backwards? Um, so some of the findings are showing that the breakdown of communication systems between, that there's some breakdown of communication and there is room for improvement on that. The integral trauma, uh, intergenerational trauma of Indian residential school systems. Um, that we need to ensure that there is um, more cultural wellness supports during evacuation. And often um, there's limited cultural spaces. So to ensure that we are including cultural spaces um, such as providing country foods to those um, and healing to those that are, are requiring that. So um, 
these are some quotes that we heard from during our interviews and I just put them up there for your consideration for you to have a look at and I think it's really important and there's small ways that you know when providing service that we can do that will really make a difference and and one of them you know was an, an example that I heard from from community was that you know even just getting women in in Indigenous women who are interested, involved in providing, you know, in cooking and providing meals, traditional meals, traditional foods to their community members is a good way for women to get together and feel like they're doing something that's a benefit, that is, you know, of community and they get to share and 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 build that sense of, um, how do I say that? They just have an opportunity to be together and there's healing from that that can happen and allowing a way uh, forward in EM uh, emergency management or when it's on the ground allowing ways for communities to really be involved in a way that they need to be involved for their own well-being so my last slide is this one um, I like to finish and show pictures of these young people I have my children up there as well um, because the reason why I do this work and I feel that this work is so important is for really those generations coming up behind me and yes, it is very overwhelming working in the climate change field, um, but I am very much inspired by seeing um, the incredible work that Indigenous people are doing across this country. Um, indigenous peoples are real leaders in climate change adaptation, and I'm just honored to be able to, to do this work, and I do it for so that my children can have a, you know, bright and happy future as well as those other kids coming up behind us um, in our communities. So. Um, happy to answer any questions and really I'm honored to be here today to share some of this information. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Erin. Um, those were two very interesting presentations. And so at this point in time, I'd like to take a bit of a pause and provide an opportunity for people to ask questions. Um, if you are participating uh, virtually, um, you can type questions into the panel box and um, then we will be able to um, read those questions and then um, ask the speakers to respond. If you're in one of the rooms, um, just raise your hand. I can see the people here that are with me in Winnipeg, uh, but if you raise your hand in uh, uh, the facilitators in Regina and Edmonton, we'll let um, my colleague Cameron um, no, and um, he will um, direct us to open up the line to enable you to raise your question for us. Uh, so at this point in time, I'd ask if anyone has any questions that they would um, like to ask, um, either Aaron or Katie. I have Saqib here for Saskatchewan. Could I uh, just make a comment, please? Uh, sure, yes. Thank, so, thanks, uh, um, Katie and Aaron, for these presentations. And the comment I would like to make is, which both of your presentations I actually highlighted, was that, you know, a lot of our focus in health certainly is on recovery after an event like forest fires. But I think you highlighted that, that uh, you know, between events, there's a lot of time for reflection, and the comment I wanted to make, and, and you could uh, you know, comment on that now or uh, later during the webinar, is that, you know, it has greater awareness of our uh, link to the land through climate change and in the past through sustainable development or stewardship or One Health. A lot of the areas that you work in has this increased our appreciation of our link to the land, and is that a bit of a protection as part of adaptation against climate change? Um, and also, uh, does that address uh, some of the sense of helplessness that people feel that I think there's a slide that showed all the uh, manifestations of powerlessness and helplessness. So that is just a comment, but I think certainly from my side, that's something that we don't really actively explore the core benefits uh, around you know, greater awareness of the environment and linkage and stewardship. So uh, that is just a comment. Um, and you don't have to answer that, but I thought I'd just mention that, especially in terms of later discussions as well. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have one question. Oh, we have more questions now. Um, I'm from the <coughs> participants virtually. So uh, the first one I have is actually for Aaron. Thank you for the great presentation. 
Are you considering converting your research to quantitative data that can help see how much mental impact is happening? Yeah, so, are you, so you're talking about um, the climate change program funding, is that correct? Or with regards to evacuations? I'm sorry, that's the extent of the question that I have so far. Oh, okay. Um, I think, you know, it's exciting because, it's exciting, I should it's, I think it's interesting because in the la I've been on this file for 12 years and I would say Ashley and Shirley and Inez's work about a couple years ago was really one of the first of its kind looking at Inuit and mental health of climate change. Um, and But more and more, and I'm so excited that this panel today because this is becoming a more concerning, we keep hearing about it. So yes, I think over time we're gonna be um, gathering this information and, and trying mapping it and, and trying to make it um, accessible, but people want to know more and more. Like I said, we've only really funded out of, in 12 years out of close to 200 projects, I would say maybe um, 10 are directly linked to mental health and climate change, even though all the others will obviously help support mental health well-being um, based on the work that they're doing. Um, so yes, I think for sure we will be able to, to keep gathering this information and making it more available and, and things like that. Thank you. Um, there's a question uh, from somebody here in the room. Uh, if you could just introduce yourself and then ask a question. Hi, Erin. It's Wayne Ludman from Winnipeg. Uh, hi, Wayne. Hi. I, I agree strongly with uh, two points that you made. One was about the country food and its impact on on um, uh, on mental health and, and well-being just in terms of feel-good food. And the second on recreational services. My, my question is, What's the biggest impact that you've seen on the mental mental health and well-being of evacuees when it when it comes to recreation? What's the biggest impact that recreation has made? Uh, and the, the second is how are the evacuees sourcing or how are the coordinators sourcing country food for the evacuees when it's probably coming from the, the region that's evacuated? Yeah, those are two great questions, and I'm not sure how to answer them to be honest. Um, the country food piece is one that we hear a lot. Um, the solution to that I don't think has been um, figured out yet. I know that there's some really great case discussions about this. Um, because there's so many jurisdictional issues and different, the EM works so differently within each of the provinces. And, and so I know there's, a, I think there's gonna be momentum to try and include country food more um, because there's such value and, and we know that this is what communities are wanting to have access to while they're evacuated. Um, so right now I, can, I don't have any examples of if that, what's happening with that, unfortunately, but I think this is something that's gonna come up a lot more um, in the next year when we release some of the findings. Um, and your second question, sorry, was about recreation. What, what's the biggest impact that you've seen on mental health in terms of introducing recreation to the evacuees? Um, that too, I think that depends, you know, I think one of the biggest things we keep hearing about is that communities um, who have been evacuated just want access to be able to practice uh, their ceremonies, to be able to, um, to you know, say drum um, and get together and, and practice their culture within um, that environment and be connected in that way. We haven't heard much, I mean, of a person, I, I you know, I love to get involved in, in a variety of different things, and it does for me um, increase my mental well-being. So I think, you know, having recreation involved in some of these things, as long as those are identified needs of community, would be excellent. You know, getting kids to play some soccer, or you know, getting kids to play, I think, is really important. And I think that's going to come out of the research that we're funding this current fiscal year with regards to reducing PTSD impact or PTSD in children during evacuation. So I think that too is is really interesting, and and we'll see more of that coming forward, moving forward. Thank you, Erin. Um, I now have a question from the virtual presenter, virtual presenters um, that's probably best answered by Katie. And um, that is, um, are we um, building into the discussion efforts around climate denial as part of the response to mental health? Basically, are we seeing, we're seeing climate activists pushing themselves to exhaustion in their work, and it, is that actually being taken into consideration as part of this uh, discussion around uh, mental health? Yeah, so, um, yeah, that's a really great question. 
because we know, you know, when we're considering mental health, we need to consider uh, cognitions and perceptions of climate change as well. Um, so as an example, in the climate change and health report, the mental health chapter, we do focus briefly on uh, perceptions of climate change and that, how that impacts actions and awareness. Um, what we really tend to focus on um, is less so, I think, what, what you're speaking to, but more so um, one of the, the biggest issues is not necessarily climate change denial, it's climate change disavowal. And what climate change disavowal really is, is that you're seeing with one eye open, you're aware of the issue, you, you know, you believe in climate change, but you have no um, impetus to act. So your other eye is closed. So, um, you know, we don't want to have uh, substantial changes in our lifestyle. Um, and we have maybe perhaps a sense of this eco paralysis. And so it's really um, about how do we inform climate change actions when we talk about the risks and impacts. So any communication that we have about, you know, these are the, the dire consequences that we're facing um, with climate change. In my opinion, we need to pair those uh, risks and impacts, those messages of risks and impacts with how do you act on them um, to support people to know that there are tangible actions, whether it's community level actions, whether it's um, actions to petition governments to do different things, um, whether it's um, gardening or having individual behavior change, those different types of things. I think it's important that um, we're considering the role of perception and action and, and how those two things shape together. Um, because it can be a long, daunting um, struggle for many climate activists who are in the field on the ground all the time, again, feeling that sense that their actions aren't quite um, putting a dent in the climate change problem. But I think it's important to continue to create awareness about what is being done around the world, um, to share best practices, to share our strife and our grief together um, so that we can um, work together to transform those things into to tangible actions. Thank you. Um, I understand there's now a question in Edmonton, from somebody in Edmonton. Um, it, it's Mark Harassman here. I'll be one of the presenters. Can you hear me? Yep, yep. loud and clear. Excellent. Okay, so it's, in, it's on the comment about what are we doing in these times where we're not in a disaster or not in ecological climate change. And what was interesting, and I was just going to add it into the last part of my presentation, was that just from Public Safety Canada just recently, uh, they've uh, published an emergency management strategy for Canada. It's uh, entitled Toward a Resilient 2030. And it speaks to actually creating a framework um, whereby the different uh, federal, provincial, and territorial governments would work towards creating resiliency so we're actually preparing ourselves in better fashions for these events in the future. Um, this is something I can share after the presentation, but it speaks to directly what the first question was of this set of what's being done now when we have time to get ourselves more organized. That's one of the initiatives that's occurring. Um, then I think we have, I'll take, communicate one more question um, for Katie, and then I think we'll need to move on within the, the webinar. Um, Katie, the question has been asked, the rural communities seem to be disproportionately affected by climate change. Uh, do the mental health demographics reflect that observation? And is being disconnected from the land protective um, in relation to climate change related stress and mental illness? Great. So um, in terms of the first question, um, when we're when we're talking about uh, rural communities, yeah, we are definitely seeing that um, because um, for many communities, the mental health infrastructure is not in place. Um, so that can be a deterrent for many. However, uh, for example, in in the community of High River, um, it's a town of about um, um, my gosh, I can't even, I don't have the statistics right now in my, in my, my brain. But, um, it's a smaller rural community. It's considered a rural town. Um, what really gets a lot of the community members through wasn't necessarily the mental health infrastructure. It was the sense of community that they created. So that was highly protective. So in rural communities, you may have less access to formal mental health care, but um, there are access uh, pathways to community resources, whether it's faith-based group, whether it's community um, suppers. I know that that's a, a, a large component um, in High River. They have monthly suppers. Um, there's lots of different community hubs that have been um, rebuilt and retained in the community. 
Um, and then, sorry, what was the, the second question? Whether being disconnected uh, from the, the land and, um, actually provides a bit of insulation uh, against the mental impacts of change. I see. Actually, what the research shows, and I think this, this relates to the first comment um, um, uh, from one of the, um, the speakers on the phone, was that it's what we're seeing is more protective is actually creating that and facilitating that relationship with the land. So a lot of um, the different advice or different um, programs that support people's mental health is reconnecting with the land. Um, for youth, that might be wilderness therapy. Um, a common practice in, in Japan is uh, forest bathing. Um, uh, there are different um, kind of mindfulness and Buddhist based principles where it's about connecting with nature and, and facilitating that relationship. So I, I've seen, I haven't seen any research that really talks about um, distancing from land based activities as protective. I think um, it's about cultivating that relationship with the land that helps to support uh, additional action on the issue area. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I think now we're ready, um, or we'll move on to uh, the case study portion of the, this webinar. Um, we are going to begin by having a presentation by uh, Ms. Yamakini, Lori Brake Rock, um, a Kainai uh, Apisapi Kani activist and environmentalist. And she is going to be talking about the issue of ecological grief, which has um, been highlighted a bit already within this webinar. So, uh, Lori, if I can turn it over to you. Okay, uh, good Good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Ms. Samaki, longtime uh, woman, or Lori Braverock is my English name. I am an enrolled member of the Kainai Blood Tribe and Amskapi Bikani Blackfeet Tribe, which are two tribes of the Blackfoot Confederacy. And I'm presenting today from uh, the Kainai Blood Tribe, which uh, is uh, Canada's largest uh, Indian reservation. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I've been listening in and it's all, all uh, really, really great things that I'm hearing here. So I'm, I'm very happy to be a part of uh, the, the webinar today. So uh, just looking at uh, the impacts of climate change and, and looking at ecological grief from uh, uh, Indigenous perspectives. So uh, for me, my inspiration comes from uh, Bullhorn Coulee, which is uh, on the uh, blood reserve here. Uh, this is where I grew up. Uh, what you see here is just a shadow of what used to be, what once was. Uh, there was a time uh, when, as a child, that we would bolt down these uh, uh, canals here, uh, the this you know the, what would snake through the coulee here, and in some places I know that the water was up to 12 feet deep, eight feet deep, and it was crystal clear. I mean there was uh, three types of fish I could think of. Uh, there were beavers. I remember uh, how my mom fought an otter once for a fish that she caught here. Um, and this is what it is today. There are no more fish. Uh, there pretty much is no more animals other than the deer that come through. Um, and, the, you know, everything has changed here drastically. So where Bullhorn Coulee is, it's actually just south of the canal here that leads uh, you know, the agricultural canal that goes down and it goes down to very many communities because we're very close to the headwaters here in southern Alberta. So uh, from Bullhorn Coulee here, we see, um, you know, that the, the water that used to come here just doesn't come here anymore. So uh, and this is my uh, like I said, my inspiration for what I do, because uh, seeing the changes and this was a place that I would go to feel rejuvenated and to, you know, be connected in, in all of that. But now to go there, it is uh, it is becoming a, a sadder and sadder site every year and, and to see the place that I grew up. So my dream is to one one day see this as, uh, you know, what it once was. So uh, going back to uh, prior to colonization, uh, the creation of plants and the Nitsitipi, uh, we had uh, very many uh, stories, pretty much everything uh, that uh, our cultural, uh, our Blackfoot culture was very, very strong. Uh, we had never lost our Sundance, our annual Ogon. It still continues to this day. 
uh, it happens uh, annually. We have uh, all of our societies that are still very much involved in, in uh, our Sundance and in our culture. So we understand that our culture is tied directly to the land. We know, uh, we under, we've always understood that cycle of life, you know, the plants that grow from Mother Earth that nourish the animals and, you know, and on to us. And, you know, we, we've always understood that. So our history uh, traditionally has been shared uh, orally through stories such as this. So we've always seen these, um, we've always had these stories that really went along with every plant and animal had a story that went with it. And so now we're seeing that, uh, you know, we're seeing that you know, these stories, we don't share them anymore. <clears throat> and so this is one of the things that we want to start bringing back, you know, the importance of our plants, they, they're it, so important to us that they, they had a story that went with them. And some of those stories were even given to us by creator. And so Knowing this uh, with uh, our creator and with uh, Mother Earth here, uh, we see that uh, this is what uh, Creator and Mother Earth had provided. They, they, I mean, provided everything for us. Uh, all of our meals, all of our tools, our clothing, our home. So every, again, every part of our culture tied directly to the land itself. So this we're looking at uh, a meal that we would have had, you know, again, prior to colonization. And uh, when we look at the, <clears throat> the main source, which for, for our tribe here and for the Blackfoot uh, people needs it to be, would be uh, the buffalo or the bison. So right now we are currently involved with the INE initiative uh, and that's restoring and bringing the buffalo back. So right now in Amskapi Bikani and the Blackfoot Nation, they've already reintroduced the buffalo and we've been working with them here, uh, the Kainai Nation with them to, uh, you know, start partnering with them to bring the buffalo back here to the blood tribe or to Kainai. So these herds, of course, we know uh, were decimated <clears throat> all in the effort for assimilation. So, but we also want to recognize that although uh, we felt the effects of colonization, our plants and our animals were also affected by colonization. And one of the main, uh, like the buffalo here was really one of the uh, animals that really promoted uh, growth and and more plants and diversity in our areas. <clears throat> so without them, you can see that we've definitely been um, dealing with some impacts with, with their loss. And a lot of that, again, being through colonization. So in this photo, I've actually got a picture of the uh, St. Mary's Residential School. And uh, my room was actually the third row up in the center and just second from the left there. So that was my room there and I had stayed there for uh, four years from the time I think I was about eight years old. So it, it was run by our tribe at the time, but uh, we were still being separated from our families for you know Monday to Friday. We only go home on the weekends. Uh, so it was still um, not an ideal situation. And, and my reason for being there was one of the things that we hear on many reservations, which is overcrowding. So as you can see in the other photo there, this uh, residential school has is no longer there anymore. It was uh, turned into our uh, college. So we had the Red Crow Community College that was there. And when the fire broke out, it was it was the college at that time. So that happened in 2015, and it's 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 created a lot of mixed feelings just with that loss there. But um, again, uh, you can see all of the different things and and all the various ways that were affected, which all have a direct tie to uh, mental health and all of the um, negative impacts that we're seeing today. So when we look at our edible plants, you know, these are something that uh, we're still actively uh, participating in. 
pick, picking them. And to me, I look at the mental health benefits just from picking, um, being outdoors, being with family, because these are social gatherings. And these are some of the best memories that I have growing up are picking with my family, my mother, uh, my grandparents, my uh, relatives. And so to me, I, I believe that there are very many uh, mental health benefits to just being outside, being with family and, and you know, doing these kind of activities together. Some of the things though that we're seeing is that uh, these plants are getting less and less, uh, they're getting harder and harder to find. Um, and some of the things that we're looking at to uh, reduce those or mitigate against those kind of impacts is new picking practices. So traditionally we would pick and, and the whole root would come out. So now we're trying to teach, maybe we you know, can start cutting them, um, cutting the plants and leaving the roots in place because even just picking in some areas are, are actually wiping those areas out. So that's, you know, that's something that we're uh, considering here with our, um, our edible plants. But the same things are happening with our medicinal plants as well. So when we look at the uh, mental health benefits, I recently attended and I actually work at uh, Kane Wellness Center and I've only been here for uh, since July of 2018. And so I'm, I'm, I'm but the majority of our um, clients that we're dealing with are coming here for uh, mental health uh, counseling. They're coming here to deal with their addictions and uh, getting on that path to recovery. So I'm seeing working with them uh, directly and and just you know knowing their background because I myself had been in a residential school. So um, it, it's very much in, in the forefront of my mind these days. So one of the things though that when we're looking at our medicinal plants and with our edible plants here are the threats that we're facing. So along with uh, climate change, it's climate change is really, really uh, making it uh, a lot more challenging for our native plant species because the you know uh, on the left there you see the leafy spurge and then on the right you see the um the thistle and this whole area now you can see the blades of grass those are actually sweet grass so this was near my home it does not exist anymore the the leafy spurge and the thistle they they basically taken over this this sweet grass patch so this doesn't exist anymore so we're looking at threats from invasive species and like i said climate change is just intensifying this so like i said we've already we're already aware that this patch has been lost to invasive species and we're trying to uh, you know, get get the word out that, you know, we need to start looking at how to uh, address these kind of concerns when we're looking at losing areas to invasive species. The other threats that we face here on the Blood Tribe in, in particular is uh, resource development. Right now, we still have fracking going on. We still are very much in uh, the midst of uh, oil and gas uh, development here. And then we've always had our agriculture, uh, which is basically consumed uh, great swaths of our uh, native plant and grassland areas. So in our area, the area, the video I showed you before, that, that was actually one of the natural grassland areas near our home, which is now being overtaken by the invasive species. So we're, um, you know, that that itself is very, uh, it's it's very daunting, you know, looking at that when there's just myself and my husband that live on how many acres and, you know, we're just watching this invasive species literally take over our, our land. So um, having these kind of threats as well, as far as resource development, you know, there are very, very, very many, um, you know, things that we're trying to take from our land here that, you know, we, we need to find a way to mitigate that and find a way to a balance. So recently, uh, we've also been dealing with the uh, climate impacts from fires and the drier seasons. Uh, we know that already this season, we've seen very little moisture and as far as snowfall. Uh, we've had, had plenty of the coal, just not enough of the snow to go with it. So um, I'm, I'm already getting concerned about what our summer is going to look like, um, being that this is what we had to deal with back in 2017. Uh, where my home is, I'm probably about 25 minutes away from Waterton if I drive from my house there. So it was a very stressful time. We did not evacuate. We chose to stay with our home. We chose to stay 
and uh, you know be on hand if any of our neighbors needed help. But we we stuck it out. But it was it was uh, it was stressful, you know, to say the least. And so. Um, you know, we're seeing the hotter, drier weather, um, and I know that uh, listening to uh, what happened in Fort McMurray, where, you know, we watched that very closely, you know, we looked at how, um, you know, well, uh, many of those people had relocated, and I remember having the discussion with my family, like, you know, where would we go? You know, we wouldn't know, we wouldn't have anywhere else to go. We would find a way to you know, try to stay with our land. You know, traditionally we've um, never been moved from our lands. So our leaders, uh, Red Crow in particular, you know, our ancestors had, you know, fought for this land. You know, we as uh, Nitsitipi, as the Blackfoot territory, we've never been moved. We've always been here. Uh, we've, like I said, we've always had our Okan, our, our, our Sundance. So traditionally and culturally, we've always had that strength. So when looking at, uh, at a, adapting to uh, what is happening today with climate change, uh, some of the, the things that we're, um, how we're kind of trying to deal with that is the biggest thing would be education. Uh, education, now we're starting to go into the schools and we're starting to share some of this information of what, we've, what we're learning here. But we're also looking at restoration. So right now we're working with the Kainai High School. Uh, they're, they've got their greenhouse uh, that they've had many years ago, but it, it's that derelict. So they've got that going again. The focus will be on uh, native plant restoration. So that and uh, just partnering, partnerships, networking, and doing uh, and bringing back the cultural activities that we do on the land, such as picking. But again, uh, looking at uh, we've also done uh, traditional meals, uh, and uh, we, we've recently had meat cutting classes. There was a pemmican making class, uh, and then through the Kainai Ecosystem Protection Association, where I'm a committee member, we've uh, we have an annual summit that happens in uh, the beginning of June, and we've been doing plant tours. We've been doing tours throughout the reserve, and. Uh, you know, just taking more uh, efforts to get people out onto the land and connecting to the land by by getting them out there. So uh, for me, just that's kind of where I'm going to end off. And just, you know, for me to say that um, after everything that I've gone through uh, in my life, having been through residential school, having, you know, dealing with all of the things, having grown up here on reserve, um, you know, if it wasn't for my culture and for my family ensuring my identity as uh, an it's it to be, I, I wouldn't be here. You know, my culture is really my resiliency. And I think that has uh, the word resiliency as far as an indigenous people is a, a very key word. And I believe that resiliency is tied directly to our culture. And that that to me is going to be um, and the land is really the only way that we're going to really truly heal is is where where my perspective is coming from so um other than that i just want to say thank you uh i do appreciate the opportunity here to speak and i'm i'm like i said i'm really really enjoying everything that i'm hearing today and i'm i look forward to more discussions on this thank you thank you laurie um before we move into the next presentations, which all have a theme around wildfire, I thought maybe I would ask if there's um, one or two quick questions for uh, Lori at this time. If there aren't, then we can just, uh, we'll move forward and we, then if anything of others, there of course will be an opportunity to do as raised questions um, after the other set of uh, presentations are done. Okay. I don't necessarily have a question, just a comment. I was inspired what you say uh, by what you presented and um, how useful it would be in our shifting our whole thinking away from what we're doing now towards a kind of world which uh, um, would address climate change in a in a way that's uh, you know in a way that shows that people can be at their best. That's all I wanted to say. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks.
Sakip from Saskatchewan, could I just ask a quick question as well? Sure, yes. Um, so thank you, uh, Roy, for this uh, presentation. And the question I had, and uh, and again, it could be for discussion at the end as well, was that there's an earlier slide that Erin showed on high number of evacuations and, and prairies were highly represented, Saskatchewan also highly represented, uh, and related to forest fires. And, and some of it could be relevant for Nisa as well, for Nandi and uh, Dr. Nandi Nubuk and colleagues. And, uh, is, that, is, is there any way to uh, study going forward maybe about how um, community capacity, indigenous, non-indigenous, relates to decision to evacuate or stay uh, as long as it's safe to do to stay and 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 how that uh, 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 is there a way to study that because um, you know evacuation obviously is very dramatic and um, and is, is there a way to increase community capacity to not be able to evacuate if not required but I, I'm I'm assuming that would that be connected to uh, capacity to manage issues at a local level instead of being asked to evacuate, not only by local leadership, but by provincial emergency planners as well. So that is just a common, I, I don't think there's an easy answer, but uh, but if there's a quick answer to that right now, or, or maybe it could be part of later discussion as well. Thanks. Uh, Lori, do you have a, an immediate response to that question or comment? Um, I'm not quite sure how to respond to that but i do say that uh, i know that uh again our the work that we've been doing with kind of ecosystem protection association that we've been <clears throat> getting approached more about being involved uh, like one of the uh things that we've um uh, are trying to work towards is the renaming of some of the mountains in waterton lakes national park and getting those uh <clears throat> re renamed to what the names that we had given them traditionally so uh we are involved when you know when the opportunity presents itself and then it is a it is a um it, it, it's a it's kind of a slippery slope right because then we're dealing with federal provincial and 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 so there's a, a lot of different uh things that we find um you know that uh, as as a reserve that it, it gets a little bit tougher because when we want to talk about water issues and then that becomes a federal thing and then we want to talk about the land and that becomes a provincial thing, you know. So we we get involved when and where we can, but sometimes those things can be political, and so it makes it a little bit more challenging. I, I hope that's kind of along the lines of what what, what was being asked. That's good. Thank you, Lori. This is Nandi in the work of from Saskatchewan. Maybe if I may just comment a little bit on that um, uh, question or comment from Sakib. Um, actually, if you don't mind, at this point in time, I think we'll need to move on to the next presentations. Um, okay, I'm just trying to make changes at the time, and there will be, of course, more opportunity for question and answer towards the end. So um, then I would like to... Um, move on to the next set of case studies. And we're going to have two presentations that at least in part um, look at the impact of the Fort McMurray wildfire on mental health of that community. And the first presentation is going to be given by Mark Rasmuk, um, the director of the Health Disaster Recovery Program of the Addictions and Mental Health Branch and the Health Services Delivery Division of Alberta Health. And he's going to be speaking about psychosocial supports during natural disasters. So Mark, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. And I'm very happy to be presenting here on, and respectfully presenting on Treaty 6 land here in Edmonton uh, for the Prairie Regional Collaborative Adaptation Collaborative. I'll get it right yet. Um, so yes, I'm going to jump right into my presentation. Uh, my presentation is going to look at this from a kind of a completely different lens from the last two. It's going to look at the acute response <laughs> The acute responses that we did in Alberta for the Fort McMurray wildfires, as well as what our health services did as well. So for clarity, I work for the government of Alberta within Alberta Health, which you know handles programs and budgets, and then Alberta Health Services does delivery. I have some information from Alberta Health Services that I'll be presenting today, 
as well as what we're going to be doing for next steps and in collaboration with Municipal Affairs, some other pieces that we're considering to uh, put in place for a future event. So I will be focusing on my presentation today about acute responses to environmental effects. Um, it, it may be difficult to extrapolate some of the psychosocial responses of Albertans to longer term environmental change, but a lot of the pieces that Katie was bringing up will come up in my presentation as well of what we put in place for some support for Albertans as they experience some of these disastrous impacts. From uh, our perspective, uh, we also, in the presentation after mine, Dr. Ayapong will be going to present uh, some of the stats in, in a further level of detail than I'm going to have in my presentation. And uh, I'll be jumping into it. Now, this is active. Yes, no. There we go. So, our first slide speaks a little bit to what uh, Kitty was speaking to the psychosocial support and kind of what they are. What we start to look at, and it's sort of an inverse pyramid of need is what you have in this slide, where basic uh, services and security is looked after by individuals, and that's the first thing that they need. But more, there are fewer people that may need more community and family support, which a lot of the previous speakers were speaking to in a lot of the in Indigenous communities that were available and the supports that they were putting in place. Even further, you have more people and you don't have as many that need more focused interventions or potentially specialized clinical services. To see this inverse pyramid again and how Alberta Health Services utilized this concept in order to put in place supports for people that were uh, victimized by the Fort McMurray fire. This other chart is one that uh, we use at Alberta Health, which speaks to the different phases that people will go through potentially just pre-disaster, an impact, and how emotions on the heroic side will start to go up a little bit, and then they'll hit a bit of a honeymoon period, and then as they go back into the community to go rebuild, they're going to go into a bit of a disillusionment phase. And this was a lot of the rationale that we used on behalf of a government to put in place enhanced services in anticipation of more mental health needs by people in the community during this phase, and it gave us a time frame as to when we'd need to put those services in place. It was also interesting to note that what the challenge in Fort McMurray was, was that people did not go all back in on June 1st. A lot of them came in back in August and in September and later, so that we had a community where multiple people, multiple groups of people, were going through this cycle at different times, depending on when they returned to the community. Just some quick stats on what happened in Fort McMurray. Uh, the, quick, the biggest evacuation in Alberta history, um, the census population in the area is over 125,000 people, 10 communities, 80 plus spoken languages up there. There's also a very big temporary and shadow population up in Fort McMurray, whereas you get a lot of these work camps housing about five to 8,000 people up there in multiple locations that are generally self-sufficient. But for Fort McMurray, we had to evacuate these people down generally one highway, and some people were evacuated to the north. Of total, over 80,000 people were evacuated, and this involved uh, the acute care hospital as well, which was shut down. Backing up, because I missed the slide. There we go, state of emergency. So what happened with Fort McMurray, and this is where the province kicks into some of its emergency powers. The first emergency power is that and the declaration that essentially gives the minister responsible, which at first would have been the ministers of uh, municipal affairs, extraordinary powers to react to the crisis. This is just you know to get more firefighters in place, more supports in place for the response phase of the disaster. But in addition to that, at Alberta Health, the chief medical officer of health also has enhanced responsibilities during an emergency. The Public Health Act grants the minister the authority that during the state of emergency to, and I'll read out a few of these, to acquire the use of real or personal property, authorize or require any qualified person to render aid of any type the person is quali qualified to provide, authorize conscription of persons when needed to meet an emergency, authorize the entry to a building or land, and it goes on from there, but you get the picture that uh, there are powers that are actually put in place in order to respond to the response phase of an emergency. However, from an addiction and mental health perspective, Alberta Health 
in addition to activating our emergency operations center, which brings all of our department heads together within Alberta Health, where we can put in place more supports for first responders if they're needed, uh, more uh, supports for Alberta Health Services, whether or not we get mobile facilities on the ground, whether or not we need to get a psychological first aid support, which was already mentioned, or whether or not we need more EMS. What we need to do is, as the disaster unfolds, determine what may be needed and overtaxed from our current system, and then look at putting in memorandums of understanding between provincial jurisdictions in order to get other resources from other jurisdictions to come in and help us. And in the Fort McMurray wildfire, we actually got the BC psychosocial team to come in and help us with some psychological first aid. In addition to that, we activated for the first time, in addition to our emergency operations center, the emergency coordination center, the AMH ECC, which actually specifically focused on coordinating a number of the different players up in Fort McMurray. So when it comes to the resources that the government looks at coordinating and putting in place in a community and for this disaster, it isn't just the government or Alberta Health Services providing, but we coordinated with our emergency coordination center for with the addiction and mental health branch, um, the industry, there was OSCA there, there was the NGOs, the non-government organizations, we had the indigenous populations at our table, we had health services, we had uh, Alberta Health Care, Canadian Red Cross was also involved, and there's other targeted populations. We also had other um, groups such as Good Samaritan up there that were providing support. So it's a matter to identify where a need was, and then we did a lot of creating the connection so that the people who needed support knew who to call to get the support and put them in place during the emergency. It was a big part of our coordinating role during the response phase. Now, health services saw, as they were activated, a number of, of different things. First of all, during the evacuation phase, they created reception centers. People were evacuated to reception centers, and of course, within the reception centers, there was put in place people who were trained in psychological first aid. Uh, there was a need as well for addiction and mental health spe specialists who attended vulnerable populations at this time. It was interesting what they found after they had evacuated Fort McMurray and people were arriving at these reception centers, that the focus was on validating and normalizing their experiences and reactions. That the fear, the grief, the loss, the anger, uh, listening to their stories, the psychological impact was actually intensified now, now that the people's most immediate needs were being addressed. It goes back to the pyramid. I'm, I'm safe now, okay, I'm, I'm in a safer location. And now people begin to react and realize what's happening to them. Okay, so that's what they experienced. So we, what then we did within the reception centers was put processes to link people and loved ones with social support. Social media played an important positive role in this regard, but at the same time created more distress. Don't have control over social media, it can go and spin in either direction as people were looking to social media for their information and updates, but some of it was sensational. We had to balance that as well. The other thing that I'd like to highlight at this point on this slide was a little bit of things that were mentioned about first responders. And it's very important to note that even through this time, occupational stress injuries, and these are things like PTSD, even for first responders, this is where it was important and there are processes in place for first responders to get peer support and other support through this process and at this time. And after the fire, it was a phased re-entry because the phased re-entry was based on um, how the, the level of destruction within the community, the ones that were more affected by fire and less affected by fire. Obviously, we put people back in Fort McMurray that were in the less affected region. But we had to make sure the infrastructure was in place. Uh, reception centers were set up with information. Uh, again, we had the psychosocial supports put in place, people trained with PFA. There was relief groups trained in disaster response, coordinated effort led by the municipality, support by Alberta Health Services, Canadian Red Cross, faith groups, disaster response groups, and Samaritan's Purse. There was also Indigenous-specific um, reception centers that were created in Fort McMurray so that as Indigenous people came back to Fort McMurray, they could go to their own reception centers that would provide them the same information, uh, but in a different environment. 
that was also done as well as indigenous travel teams that went out to the different um, reserves and uh, Métis settlements up there. The observations were that the people were happy to be home, reconnecting with friends and families. They were focused on their basic needs initially, getting their homes cleaned and restored. However, a lot of anxiety about the immediate and longer term health impacts uh, was a forefront. So as re-entry continued and with more people impacted, there was a need for more information. And this is sort of the, the big tier of what everybody needed initially. Um, and this is where both Alberta Health and Alberta Health Services worked to provide providing consistent messaging and support, because this was in instrumental on uh, providing information on housing, finance, clothing, food, and access to psychosocial support. The uh, addiction and mental health services at this time shifted from more of a drop-in, accessible, less structured service, and this met the needs of providing the active listening, supportive counseling, problem solving, resource identification, and if needed, linkages to more formal mental health assessment and treatment. The re-entry was, I'm just going to highlight a few things on these slides. Obviously, this slide indicates a lot of the players that uh, were responsible to get people back up in Fort McMurray because after the hospital was closed for a period of time, they didn't open it the very next day. There was a lot of uh, essential smoke damage or smoke involvement within the hospital. The hospital had to be wiped down and cleaned from ceiling to walls to floors to all the surfaces. So what Alberta Health Services did is they created an urgent care center in the parking lot, and I'm going to have a picture of that right away. But the Northern Lights, the Regional Hospital Emergencies Department opened as they began to rehabilitate the rest of the hospital. So what Alberta has is they have this pick tent system that's uh, shown in these pictures here, where they set it up in the parking lot. It's a very sophisticated mobile mash sort of unit kind of idea where they can have a positive air pressure within them, and these actually can become full surgical suites as needed, okay, in the parking lot. And actually, this is what they used while they were rehabilitating the hospital to Fort McMurray, because as people came into Fort McMurray cleaning up or working, they could potentially get hurt. So you had to have in place working health services to make sure that uh, you'd be looking after anything that came your way. Um, yeah, because even during this time, I mean, they were active, people were going back in, but air quality was reaching. Now, if you go on our websites and you search Alberta air quality, it goes from a 1 to a 10, uh, and that's what we report. But at this time, even when they had these tents set up, when they're rehabilitating the hospital, they hit numbers of 52. And this is where you had to actually wear your P100 mask, and then you also had to get that information out to the residents, and for people coming into the community, you had to make sure that they had uh, respirators or masks in order to deal with some of the particular matter that was in the air. This was the slide I told you we'd be coming back to, um, which speaks to the psychosocial supports and how Alberta Health Services uh, looked at providing it to them. And I, I like this one as well. This is a real good takeaway for me, is most of the people start off with needing the amount of information, making sure their basic needs are kept, where they can get uh, their food, support. Uh, a lot of them came into the reception centers and they got kits to clean their home. Then you go into psychological first aid if it is needed. Then after that is skills for psychological recovery. And then at the bottom of the pyramid is those more uh, in need would have access to levels of treatment. It was interesting to note that the referrals into mental health at this time, and this is just post-event, uh, were uh, basically check-in contacts. I'm going to be showing a few slides with some stats on this. And uh, it, it shifted over, over the time, but we did have an increase in the number of contacts that were reported up to 27,600 on the slide. So these next couple of slides, I just want to provide for a little bit of trending. It shows a little bit of change from uh, one time to another. Uh, you can see here on this one, reasons for the contact. And this would have been in the health services. The emotional issue has jumped up, jumps up from 2015 to 2016, but the psychiatric symptom issue seems to drop off a little bit. So it's more of an acute phase is what they were seeing right as they were moving into the community. This next one speaks to three areas of increase, and it speaks a little bit to, uh, and I heard even Katie was mentioning this, about you, know, you get more addictions, crisis, 
and some existing mental illness. If anything, we saw, and it's, uh, I want to, I want to actually get to that slide instead of tell you what the slide is going to say. So what we then saw as well is on the left there you see back in 2015 to 16, they were, uh, people would come in, present for an intervention for mental health supports, and then it would be assigned. In 2016, we were getting less people assigned to supports, but more people come in for single sessions, where they would come in, try to find the supports they needed, and then it speaks to directing them to the most appropriate support, which was the slide I had of all the different players. Do they need somebody from Red Cross? Do they need somebody from a, an indigenous community? Do they need somebody from uh, Good Samaritan? We would direct them to the appropriate supports at that time, but this was a point of contact and still supports the idea that every door would have been the right door. So the trend here, which is what I was getting at, was that there were slightly fewer inpatient admissions for the primary dose diagnosis related to mental health, but instead we saw more admissions for substance-related disorders. So it was an interesting shift post-event, but kind of almost makes sense as to, you know, if there was something that you used previously that may not have been entirely good for you, you might have been using more substance and hence we got more admissions is what we saw shortly after the event. So now my next slides are about what we're doing next. So from a government perspective, from an Alberta health perspective, we're putting in place a Provincial Psychosocial Emergency Strategic Committee. Now this is essentially the same players that we saw on the slide that were up in Fort McMurray but would be more provincially available. People like the Red Cross, people like uh, the NGOs and others that are going to be providing support. This, the goal here is we would be creating, and we have created an inventory of what all the different players bring, what Alberta Health Services brings, what uh, the Ministry of Education brings, because there's social supports in there, psychosocial supports in there, what municipal affairs can bring, what the NGOs and all the others bring. We bring these people together on a, like a biannual basis, revisit the inventories, and reinforce the relationships between these people. So that at the time of an emergency or an activation, I know that I just have to call Fred over there because Fred will do this in northern Calgary because he has the resources in order for you there. <coughs> Almost at that level of detail, but of course, it would be to the position, not the actual individual. The second thing that we do is uh, we put in place a psychosocial recovery framework with six areas of focus. And this again speaks a little bit about what Katie was doing. Again, at the government level, we're identifying that yes, we need training and education. Yes, we need community capacity and the targeted populations, indigenous support communications, monitoring evaluation. So we're putting in place, whether they're grants, capacity, or infrastructure so that these particular things are in place so people on the ground can go and put in place the training so that you can put the orange dots on the doors in the communities of High River and other places by making sure that there's trainers out there to do it. Now, Municipal Affairs looks at it a little bit differently. They have a four pillar approach because they're not as focused on just the people, which would have been mine, uh, but there's an economy piece, there's an environment piece, there's a reconstruction piece. In addition to this, which isn't on this slide, is the whole four cycle to the disaster management cycle, which is your response from an event, your recovery from an event, mitigation and preparedness are the other two. So that also fits into all of this as well. And that's in my answer to my question previously, what's being done when you're not in response, when you're not in recovery, it's the resiliency piece, which includes the mitigation and preparedness. Um, and then municipal affairs is now, so instead of not activating just the provincial uh, operation center, which is our response center where we bring together all the supports in the province, they're also focusing on a recovery missions. And these are the six recovery missions that they're using, a social services component, health and psychosocial, housing, economy, natural cultural resources, and reconstruction and safety. This is the people that we would partner with in an emergency, which would have been providing the debit cards where people were, were stuck. They were, they were leaving and not able to even get to their staff locker. They didn't have their ID. They didn't have their wallet. They didn't have any of this, anything at all. So they were given through and in coordinated with the social services, which were the ones that actually ran the debit card system, 
in this kind of recovery component. And this is where we partner further with Red Cross. Anyhow, that's what my focus was. That was my slides when I tried to pull together sort of what the government thinking was. And it more it's about setting the framework and enabling people to respond to the changes within a disaster with some steps. Great. Right. Thank you very much, Mark. That for a different look at uh, the Fort McMurray fire and its consequences. We're now going to move on to a presentation by Dr. Vincent Agupong, a clinical professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Faculty of Medicine at the University of Alberta. And um, he, I, I guess I'll just turn it over to you, Vincent, to um, begin your presentation. Thank you very much. Also would like to acknowledge uh, making the presentation here in Edmonton on Treaty 6 uh, territory. My presentation is focused on uh, part of our research, uh, which we've done in Fort McMurray. I'll be focusing this presentation on only the six months outcomes. We do have data for the 18 months outcomes, which are at various stages of, of, of publication. So I'm focusing this just on the six month outcome. The six month data, have, part of it have been published in two journals, the Journal of Mental Health and Addiction and the frontiers in psychiatry. So it's possible to get part of their presentation there. Other parts are yet to be published as well. So by way of background, we all know about the 2016 Fort McMurray wildfires being the, uh, the costliest natural disaster in Canadian history. Hundreds of uh, homes were destroyed, businesses, thousands of people were displaced. We know that natural disasters cause not only immediate uh, impact on communities, uh, but also affect communities in terms of their mental health uh, in the medium, in the short, and as well as in the long term. So this presentation is going to focus on examining the mental health effects of the community six months after the wildfires and try to identify if there were any demographic or clinical risk factors or resiliency factors. So this slide just talks about a certain of Fort McMurray, which I'm sure we are all very familiar with. By way of study design, we conducted a cross-sectional survey of residents of Fort McMurray. We uh, initially uh, calculated a sample size of 1,050 based on an estimation that if we are able to get the prevalence rate estimates, it's going to be about three, plus three or minus three percent of the estimates. We used a, a population of 60,000, although the original population from 2015 survey was about 85,000, because we know that about 20 percent of the population did not return after the wild. <laughs> We got ethics approval from the University of Alberta and all the participants uh, completed a consent form after receiving information leaflet. We surveyed participants from a variety of settings in Fort McMurray, including primary care centers, public health uh, facilities, including the main recreational facility in Fort McMurray. We surveyed some from uh, offices downtown in Fort McMurray as well as uh, from, from churches to try and get as, as wide a variety of, of people completing the survey as possible. We designed a demographic and uh, data collection tool to capture some demographic and clinical information of, of patients and we use some standardized instruments including the PAQ-9, the GAD, Seven, the PTSD checklist for DSM-5, the alcohol use identification test, as well as the drug use identification test to be able to measure the level of depression, anxiety, PTSD, alcohol, and substance use in the population at six months. We collected data in November 2016, and we analyzed the data using SPSS with chi-square test and logistic regression analysis. <clears throat> 
So for the results, we kind of distributed 1,500 survey forms, but only received about 486 completed survey questionnaires. We gave us a response rate of 39.2%. It was actually much higher, but there was so much incomplete uh, data, we, we excluded those who did not complete them. So at six months, we observed that the prevalence rate for generalized anxiety disorder was about 19, sorry, was about 19.8%. Uh, for major depressive disorder was 14.8%, and for post-traumatic stress disorder was 12.8%. We also looked at uh, the measures from the drug use and alcohol use identification test, and uh, we observed We, we observed that the, uh, the uh, prevalence rate for alcohol use disorder was 14%, and then for drug use disorder was 10.8%. We also asked patients about their self increased drug and alcohol use bef uh, after the wildfire. And as you can see, uh, quite a number of them reported increased alcohol use at 12.8%. 0% and 2.9%. We also used the Ferguson test for nicotine dependence, which actually indicated that about 6.6% .6 of the respondents were uh, dependent on nicotine. These are some of the demographic variables that we captured using the baseline data collection tool, the age, gender, employment status, relationship status. We looked at where respondents lived after the fire relative to where they lived prior to the fire. We also looked at where respondents were on the day of the evacuation, at home, at work, or out of town. More importantly, we looked at their area of residence relative to the number of destroyed properties. And we also looked at how frequently they watched television images about the devastation caused by the wildfires, whether it was daily or less frequently than daily. We also looked at how frequently respondents read newspapers or internet news items related to the wild wildfire. We looked at they are pre-existing mental health diagnosis prior to the wildfire, whether they had been diagnosed with a depressive disorder and anxiety disorder, or they had no history of a mental health disorder. We also looked at what medication they were on prior to the wildfire, an antidepressant, sleeping uh, tablet, mood stabilizing agent, or whether they were on no psychotropic medication. We also captured information on whether they received they perceive they receive sufficient support from the Red Cross, the government of Alberta, or support from family and friends. And we uh, also looked at whether they sought counseling after the wildfire and received counseling. So the results of the logistic regression analysis uh, for generalized anxiety, looking at what are some of the factors that predict generalized anxiety disorder symptoms. If you look at the p-values uh, in red, the, the, the one on the line is, is where we get significant uh, predictors. So if we go to the respondents witnessed burning of, of homes during the wildfire, we realize that those who, who actually witnessed homes being burned during the wildfire were about twice as likely to meet the diagnostic criteria for a generalized anxiety disorder if we control all the other variables in the logistic regression model. Things like the age, gender, employment status, even the area of their residence relative to destroyed properties were not, were not significant. The other interesting predictors included where 
respondents lived after the fire relative to where they lived before the wildfire. And we can see that those who lived in a different home, even though their previous home had not been destroyed by the wildfire, were about almost four times as likely to meet the diagnostic criteria compared to those who lived in the same home they lived in before the wildfire. Similarly, respondents who had a history of a depressive disorder before the wildfire were about three times more likely to uh, meet the diagnostic criteria. For an anxiety disorder which was pre-existing, it was about close to seven times more likely to meet the diagnostic criteria. The other important piece here is support from government of Alberta those who perceived they received absolute support from the government of Alberta were about 1.79, almost two times less likely to meet the diagnostic criteria compared to those who reported they received no support at all from the government of Alberta. An interesting finding was also those who received counseling after the wildfire. They were actually about 3.7 times more likely to meet the diagnostic criteria for a generalized anxiety disorder compared to those who report they did not receive any counseling. But we found there was a very high correlation, almost about one, between those who sought counseling and those who received counseling. So the explanation that we are able to come up with is that those who probably were more significantly impacted were those who went out to seek counseling, and they are the same group who obviously received the counseling, which is why probably we are we are, we are, we are recording higher levels of generalized anxiety disorder in this, this population. We also looked at the impact of elevated generalized anxiety disorder symptoms on substance use. And as you can see, we do have a significance in terms of uh, those who reported increase in their drug use, increase in their alcohol use. We also saw a significant association between the measures using the audit and the duties, which means that those who had higher levels of generalized anxiety disorder symptoms were more prone to abuse both alcohol and substances, as well as they were more likely to be nicotine dependent. Similarly, we use the logistic regression model to look at the likely predictors for major depressive disorder. And again, it's only uh, the p-values which have been underlined and in bold were significant, which means things like age, gender, employment status, relationship status, uh, where respondents lived after the fire were not significantly assisted with the likelihood of people uh, developing a major depressive disorder. However, if we look at history of anxiety disorder before the wildfire, uh, it was the odds ratio was 5.13, which means those who had a history of an anxiety disorder diagnosis prior to the wildfire were about five times more likely to meet the diagnostic criteria for a major depressive disorder compared to those who did not have that diagnosis. The other interesting finding here was support received from family and friends. We observed that the odd ratio here was 12.79 for those who did not who reported that they did not receive any support at all from family and friends, compared to those who report they received very high levels of support from family and friends. So it means that if you receive no support from family and friends, you are about 12 or 13 times more likely to present with depressive symptoms compared to those who receive support. Support from government of Alberta or the Red Cross was not significant. And again, we see the same trend with those receiving counseling being about 2.5 times more likely to present with a major depressive disorder six months after the wildfire. This also 
looks at the impact of a diagnosis of a major depressive disorder on respondents alcohol and drug use and again we can see that there was more of a likelihood to meet a diagnostic criteria for alcohol or substance use or nicotine dependence if there was a, uh, a diagnosis of a major depressive disorder so those who were depressed were more likely to use drugs alcohol as well as nicotine and finally we use the same logistic regression model to uh, look at post-traumatic stress disorder and we can see here again similar to for the generalized anxiety disorder that where respondents lived after the wildfire showed some level of significance uh, in terms of the association so those who lived in the same house before the wildfire were about 3.5 close to four times more likely to meet the diagnostic no those who lived in the same home they lived in before the wildfire were about 3.58 more likely to meet the diagnostic criteria for a PTSD compared to those who live in different homes because their previous homes had been destroyed again respondents with the history of anxiety disorder before the wildfire were about eight times more likely to meet the diagnostic criteria for a post-traumatic stress disorder and again if we look at support from family and friends we realize that those who reported they did not receive any support from family and friends were about 10 times more likely to meet the diagnostic criteria for a post-traumatic stress disorder compared to those who reported they received absolute support from family and friends we saw the same trend with counseling as well where those who received counseling were about four times more likely to meet the diagnostic criteria for a post-traumatic stress disorder we again examined ptsd and the likelihood for respondents to use drugs and alcohol and we did see that there was uh, an increase there, there was an association between increased reported use of of drugs but not alcohol and also nicotine dependence but not measures that we got from either the audit or the due date so in conclusion six months after the wildfire prevalence risk for likely GAD was 19.8 percent mdd was 14.8 percent and ptsd was 12.8 percent for fort mcmorrow residents whilst a prior diagnosis of an anxiety disorder significantly increased the risk of developing all these disorders after the wildfire high levels of support from family and friends were protective in the case of major depressive disorder and a post-traumatic stress disorder for us, high levels of perceived support from government of Alberta was protective for generalized anxiety disorder. GAD, MDD, and PTSD sufferers may also be prone to alcohol. Further studies are needed to explore the association between receiving counseling after the fire and presenting with likely GAD, MDD, or PTSD. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Vincent. That was very interesting and sort of highlighted some of the points that Katie made in her earlier presentation around the links between uh, mental health, uh, natural disasters, and climate change. Uh, so at this point in time, we're going to move on to our final presentation, which will provide a different look at the impact of wildfire on, um, on mental health. And I'm going to ask... Um, Patrick Hassler, the Emergency Response Coordinator, and Glenda Watson, a Mental Health and Addictions Advisor, um, to present on uh, mental health impacts in a community evacuation from La Ronge uh, wildfire. So turn it over to you, Patrick and Glenda. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Dr. Namdi Hindubuka, the Medical Health Officer with the Northern into Travel Health Authority, and thank you for having us today on this webinar. Um, today, uh, my colleagues here, Patrick Hassler and Glenda Watson, 
will be sharing some thoughts around the mental health impact of uh, community evacuation using the wildfire um, that happened in the Lac Trois Indian Band in 2015. So just to create the context here, um, NITA does serve over 33 unreserved First Nation communities across northern Saskatchewan. And we're using this as a case study to provide some of the thoughts around this particular topic today, just because of the magnitude of that particular event and also the potential impact that it um, created. So uh, with that, I will hand over to um, Patrick Asla. Um, uh, <laughs> sorry. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, sorry. Okay, so the presentation that we're doing is just the mental health impacts of community evacuation in Lac La Ronge. This is kind of our outline as to what we're hoping to cover just in this 10 minute period here. So if you want to just look at this, and Patrick's going to actually lead us off into the summary of the Lac La Ronge Indian Band fires of 2015. So just a quick summary into um, the response to the, mm -hmm. the northern fires in, in 2015. It was the largest response in Saskatchewan history. Um, it, it did affect our entire partnership, not just Lac Ronge Indian Band, but we're uh, kind of focusing on Lac Ronge Indian Band because it was kind of the epicenter of um, response. So Lac Ronge Indian Band members from uh, the town of La Ronge, Air Ronge, and the First Nation communities of Kitsaki, Grandmother's Bay, Hall Lake, Sikachu, Sucker River, Clam Lake, and Stanley Mission were all displaced to some degree or another. Um, evacuees were sheltered in North Battleford, Prince Albert, Saskatoon, Regina, Beardies, uh, and Okamesis Cree Nation, as well as Cold Lake, Alberta. Um, just to note when, when with that first chunk of information is that um, the distance to uh, these evacuation centers for a large number of members was anywhere from, you know, an eight to 12 hour uh, bus ride um, to get to these evacuation sites. And um, there was a significant amount of that, at least for piece, pieces and portions of the trip um, done with school buses. And our typical fire seasons here see a large number of uh, chronically ill people um, evacuated, mostly due to smoke. Um, our fire threat evacuations um, are common, but yet not, not to this degree. Our, our kind of standard response or standard season um, is, is more so smoke um, threats and air quality issues. Whereas with 2015, um, a large majority of the evacuations were direct fire threats. Um, so looking at that next um, bullet there, the evacuation timeline, um, starting in, in June 7th was when we first started um, having to move some, some chronic people out of some of these communities due to either direct fire threat or, or air quality. And then that was sustained all the way up to July 13th where, where several hundred people um, and on some occasions um, several thousand people were transported each day all the way through that response um, and really generated a, a, a very long response and, and compounded a lot of issues and problems um, in that um, seeing numbers of, of you know, 500 or 1,000 or 2,000 people evacuated during a fire season in Saskatchewan is relatively standard, um, but that that's in flux. That's, you know, as 200 are, are being evacuated, there's two or 300 returning to, to an, another community. So we don't have that sustained response for, for nearly a month and a half. And um, it really, uh, you know, the, the fatigue and um, lack of, of um, alternates within a lot of the response positions in our, our, our province um, that really became problematic as the, the response uh, drew out. Um, the next summary there is just a, a bit of a pictograph there. Um, I don't know how large it is for you guys to see, but really what I wanted to note on, on this for everybody was, you know, each of those little uh, fire marks or red dots on that map to the right of this slide, uh, 
Um, those are all representing fires of over a hundred hectares, and a lot of them, you know, in into the, the thousands of, of hectares on, on this particular year. So, um, looking at that dispersion of those red dots, that that represents a large number of our 33 communities. So, we didn't necessarily have a lot more fires as far as number of fires or size of fires than we would typically have in a year. In 2015, those fires just happened to be in close proximity to a number of communities. Um, and that really is, is, is what um, ended up the, the, the numbers that we were moving during that year. Um, repatriation for um, all of the communities did basically happen for the large numbers over a two-day period, um, but there was some phasing in, of course, of, of, of different aspects of the population and depending on what critical critical infrastructure needed to be um, fixed or, or repaired or, or insured was in place prior to going back to some of the communities. Um, some of the challenges um, that were, were noted was, again, the 2015 fire season really did begin like a typical fire season. Um, but what ended up challenging everything and overwhelming and eventually causing breakdowns was the daily increase in evacuee numbers and the sustained duration of the event. Um, there really was no time to, to take a break or to, to relax for a lot of the response agencies and, and especially the elected officials and, and health staff and responders. Um, these issues were, were greatly um, compounded as well by the, the number of evacuation sites. Um, you know, it, it's not a common thing for a large uh, group of our members to, to, you know, sometimes in a lifetime be more than, than you know, a couple hundred kilometers from, from their homes or their traditional territories or lands. And um, moving these people in some cases eight or nine hundred kilometers um, and then separating them by, by several hundred kilometers from other members of their families or family groups or support systems really compounded problems as far as tracking people and um, consistent delivery of services uh, within the different shelters. Um, the smoke and fire threats did um, through that time ebb and flow a little bit regionally or, or, or in specific pockets. And this, this caused a number of issues where, you know, elected officials would be pressured or community members would, would you know, see several days of clear air and a decrease in fire threat and would return to their homes um, only to be re-evacuated some days later as the, the winds picked up or, or the fires picked up. Um, and, and really, for the most part, a large number of the impacts and issues surrounding the movement of people from their homes um, were directly attributed to, to one of these three points. Um, and that was kind of our, our theater for, for 2015. Um, I did want to just take one, maybe maybe 20 seconds here to, to speak to a couple of things that came up in questions previous. There was somebody that was talking about traditional foods and, and activities for people while displaced. And, and this was a, was a significant facet in this response. And since 2015, um, we worked hard to procure agreements with our multi-bands and tribal councils with the Red Cross to make provisions for the delivery of these services by the communities themselves. Um, there, there really needed to be a new fresh look at things where um, you know, very learned people and, and people who are very skilled in their areas of expertise um, but yet not of First Nations descent or from First Nations communities, really had to, to you know, engage a little bit of a paradigm shift during that process to concede and accept that these communities um, are, are diverse and different. Um, there, there's very few generalities that can be made with them. And um, allowing and, and supporting those communities to make their own decisions on what types of foods they want to eat and what activities they want their children doing when they're displaced was was a, a major milestone for us and really resulted in some historical agreements um, with with the Red Cross and the provision of those services. Um, the other really brief thing I wanted to talk about is somebody had mentioned um, uh, 
whether there's been a study or, or what the path forward is in, in kind of minimizing some of these movements of people. And um, here in Saskatchewan, we've worked hard both provincially and, and locally and, and, and regionally on increasing our ability to um, have fresh air shelters and, and dispatch air scrubbers. And since 2015, um, I, I can say that, that they've, they've been a major asset um, in our response strategies and in our evacuation strategies um, by procuring those those pieces of machinery as well as setting up fresh air shelters to permanently um, stay in certain communities has definitely um, uh, had a positive impact on, on our evacuation scene here in Saskatchewan. Again, that's mostly you know related to a lot of our evacuations are due to air quality and not necessarily fire threat um, and this has really given an option for communities to be able to have the time and um, 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 kind of safety net to, to make some, some better informed decisions as to moving their populations. Um, thanks. Okay, so this is Glenda again. And before I get started on my portion here, I was going to say okie to Lori down in Blackfoot country. Um, just coming from Treaty 6 territory to Treaty 7 uh, territory, I wanted to honor that and just kind of bring attention to the relationship between the two. So, right. no problem, Lori. I was actually, I'm coming from Begunny, actually. I worked in Begunny this past spring for just under two years, and I was there during the Waterton fires where Begunny was on a potential standby to evacuate. So, it kind of brought me back to that time. Okay, thanks. So, the guiding natural disaster trauma definition that I was kind of looking to present the Lac La Ronge Indian Band fires what, to look at this would be natural disasters are usually considered traumatic, but in fact result in a range of physical and mental health outcomes. Now, a, a few of these speakers have mentioned and focused in on the physical and mental health outcomes already, so I'm not going to be focusing on in on that. The degree of exposure to a disaster is an important risk factor for developing post-disaster PTSD. More severe and longer lasting mental health outcomes are often associated with events that involve physical injury, witnessing death or injury of others, threat to life and property loss. So some of the community impacts from a holistic displacement point of view. So I wanted to present it in the way where, how were the par parents and elders impacted on a holistic level? So spiritually speaking, they were challenged with their spatial awareness of their surroundings from rural to urban. Now, we had an evaluation study done by a contracted uh, evaluationist for a 2015 Northern Saskatchewan wildfire study and by the name of Daryl Treppel. So that we'll be referring a lot during this presentation to that particular article. So when I speak to that, you, Patrick kind of went over the numbers. They were out of their homes, their region, for a period of just under two months. So that's what that spatial awareness of surroundings from rural to urban is referencing to. So the word anime, a feeling of being disconnected. So that is, again, very traditional in terms of cultural competency and cultural safety understanding. So that's what that feeling of being disconnected to one's land is speaking to. The mental, so I speak of transposition in terms of time gaps, uncertainty, a sense of abandonment of services. There was a lack of effective registration database uh, that led to a lack of accurate and timely information on location and movements of evacuees that caused a lot of mental stress on parents and elders in terms of where their other family members might have been located and sent to. On an emotional level, there was a lot of undue stress experienced during relocation. So there were a lot of reports during this evaluation study that were speaking to dorm rooms mimicking that of residential schools, uh, residential schools themselves. So that is what it's speaking to there. In addition, there was a lower level of service provided at host sites. Now this was reported at mo every site except for Regina. So given Regina was quite far from there, from the north, it was probably considered their most pleasant of experiences, but for anyone who was in any other host site, it was quite a negative experience that impacted them emotionally. 
physical, on a physical level, their basic hygienic needs were not met. There was a lack of proper nutrition, nutrition based on health needs. So if somebody was diabetic, they were not provided the, the proper foods to kind of offset that. Physical safe environment, there was triggering events like through transportation and relocation. That in itself was very troublesome for those elders and parents. How do the impacts of our parents and elders impact our children? So from a children's perspective, now I pulled from a lot of different areas here. On a spiritual level for children, it challenged also their spatial awareness of their surroundings from rural to urban. If you're used to playing very openly in a field as opposed to an urban, there has to be parental guidelines are a little bit different as opposed to in the city. So rural to urban, there was much, much difference there. Lack of holistic view of recovery, that is parents took a step-by-step -step process one day at a time rather than a whole perspective. Now this one is particular to a study that was completed in 2017 by a university professor, Blythe Shepard. So that's what that's speaking to in terms of, that was coming from the Fort Mac fire. So <clears throat> this is, in terms of what we're presenting is, there needs to be more of a look at a holistic view of recovery versus a step-by-step -step process. On a mental level, family routines and activities were disrupted, no educational exposure, partial or full PTSD following the six months, and that again was specific to the Fort Mac study that was done by Blaise Shepard. On an emotional level, inability to understand the complexity of relocation and or loss of homes, emotional neglect, parents preoccupied with post-recovery processes, and a physical level, basic hygienic needs, food needs based on age, so in for our particular area it was a lack of like even formula for babies that was reported going further now into the impacts faced by support mental health providers that included therapists counselors and crisis teams support staff eventually became evacuees themselves which in turn impacted the level of familiar support offered to community members so given that these individuals could not provide the best of their ability in terms of support to their community members, given that they too became evacuees. So there was one particular thing here where community health resources were available accompanied the priority evacuees to support their physical and mental health while out of the community. Health services that included RNs, LPNs, RPNs, physicians, and first responders, EMS, and firefighters. I refer to one particular well, two particular articles that identified four areas of the experiences and impacts by support. This is not specific to LaRange, though. So there was identification with victim as with the victim as one example. Helplessness and guilt, fear of the unknown, and physiological reactions like the autonomic nervous system, so the PNS, the SNS. So those all kind of coming together in terms of physiological reactions. Uh, and finally, like first responders, the health resources often had to work long and consecutive days with little or no time off, many of the evacuees themselves. Regional health authorities provided limited on-site resources to support those evacuees in hotels or reception centers. So these were, again, some of the impacts faced by the supports in during this time period. So that kind of brings us very a snapshot of what had occurred during that time period and without Patrick kind of being alongside that at the forefront we wouldn't have any of this information really so I just want to say thank you for listening and if I think there's a question period if you have them so I'll be happy to try and answer them great thank you very much uh, Patrick and Glenda um, I am conscious of our time, which is now we are like 15 minutes past when we originally said that we would be done with this webinar, and we have not yet had the Q&A. Um, I know that there's uh, people in the room here in Winnipeg and in Regina and, and Edmonton, um, so I would think we will continue on and take a few more questions, and um, then we'll wrap up the webinar. Uh, so if you have um, a desire to ask any questions and you're uh, participating virtually, Type them into the um, question box, and if there's a, at this time, maybe I'll ask if there's any questions that can start us off uh, from those who are participating in person, um, either in uh, Edmonton, Regina, or in Winnipeg. Uh, 
single. If there aren't any questions, I should note that I have mentally that there were some questions asked in uh, the earlier Q&A that were not uh, responded to, and I will, some of those were directed towards individual speakers, either Katie or to Aaron, and I will uh, follow up by sending those off to those individual speakers. Um, otherwise, I think maybe what we can do then is um, conclude this uh, the webinar portion of today's event. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone for attending um, the webinar and give you an extra thank you to Katie, Aaron, Lori, Mark, Vincent, Patrick, and Glenda for their really excellent and informative presentations. i will let you know that we have recorded today's webinar and we'll be posting it along with the presentations um, on the PRAC website. And there will be a short evaluation survey at the end of the webinar, which we would very much appreciate if you could fill out. And we will be sharing the survey through a follow-up email. For those who are participating in person, there's now we're going to move into more open discussion. Um, I know that there are plans for um, final presentations to be given um, by Dr. Shakib Shahad uh, in Regina and here in Winnipeg, Tony. Mars Oswald will be giving a, a presentation um, focused on the climate change help within the, each of our provinces. Um, and if you'd like to participate in the one in Regina, um, you can actually use the dial-in uh, conference code. Um, they've made available a conference code, conference code line. But, uh, for those who would wish to join um, on, by phone, are able to do so. I'd like to let you know that the PRAC will be hosting another webinar in the spring. Topics to be determined, um, but once we have determined that, we'll be sure to share with you the details. So once again, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. I hope you found it informative, and uh, that we'll have another opportunity to collaborate again in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so hi, um, can I just make a suggestion? Is it long or has the meeting ended? Oh, it ended. Okay. I think what we could do is to get oh, okay. dial in and then... We can dial in and just say that it was supposed to be the second hour, so let's try that. Is it the phone or is it the yes there? Is it both? Uh -huh.